All right. Hello and welcome everyone to today's WCS event, Breaking into Sustainability Careers. Thank you all so much for joining us today. I'm your moderator for today's event. My name is Gina Donatelli and I'm a WCS Events Committee member. Before we introduce our speakers, I'm going to briefly go over our agenda for today. Next slide, please. All right, looks like a little bit of a delay, but as we are right now, first we're gonna cover our housekeeping items and then we'll move into our four speaker presentations. And then following this, we'll uh, open up for 25 minutes of live moderated audience Q&A. So we encourage you all to drop your questions in the chat as we approach the Q&A session. Next slide, please. So just a little bit about Women in Clean Tech and Sustainability. We are an international organization focused on providing educational opportunities and mentorship to women and men in the clean tech space. Next slide, please. We have events every month, including panels and social events. Uh, so here are a couple of our upcoming events. We have mindfulness, mindfulness-centered event, environmental justice panel, and a clean tech material recycling event. Next slide, please. So some quick Zoom etiquette. I think we all know the drill at this point, but please make sure to mute yourself appropriately and share your full name on your video so that people can follow up and connect with you. We welcome you to share your LinkedIn in the chat and network. Uh, WCS will not be circulating this chat after the event to respect the uh, privacy of those looking to transition. Um, you may save the chat onto your device, but we ask to be mindful of those that are job seekers in the audience and respectful of their privacy. Next slide, please. All right, so if many of you are career transitioners, some students, some recent grads, so the WCS membership is a great resource for all of you, uh, those looking to transition, those just looking to explore clean tech uh, jobs and community. So the job board is another great resource. Um, and if you are a member, a WCS member, all events and networking is free. So we do encourage you to check that out if you'd like to. Next slide, please. So like I said, my name is Gina. I won't introduce myself again. I'm your moderator for today. Uh, so let's get into our speaker introductions. Next slide, please. As we know, clean tech jobs are on the rise and in the midst of uh, the great resignation and a really important, in time, really important time for our client, uh, climate people are looking for meaningful and fulfilling jobs. So today we have four great experts ready to share with you uh, how you can make an impact, how you can find careers that are meaningful to you, and how you can stand out as a candidate and be the change you would like to see. So I'm going to give a brief introduction of each of our speakers and they'll share a little bit more of their background as they share their stories with you during their speaker presentations. So first we have Beth Offenbacher, uh, she is a project manager of advanced energy workforce development at TRC Companies. Beth has over 25 years of experience in the industry and has helped many individuals and organizations visualize greener futures through her coaching. Next, we have Catherine McLean, founder and CEO of Dylan Green. She is an experienced leader and entrepreneur with extensive recruitment knowledge and a passion for diversifying the clean energy workforce. Next, we have Shantae Eden. CEO of Leaders Edge Consulting. She has an extensive background in DEI and project change management. She brings over 20 years of expertise integrating people, process, and technology to affect change. She'll be here today to talk about her experience making the leap into entrepreneurship. And last but certainly not least, we have Dr. Johanna Hagstrom. She's Vice President of Chemical and Hydrocarbon Fuels Technology at Lanza Tech. Johanna has spent over 12 years in the energy industry, and prior to her role at Lanza Tech, she was Director of Technology at Halliburton. She will be speaking about her experience transitioning from oil and, glass, oil and gas to clean energy. So welcome to all of our wonderful speakers. Uh, I hope you're all as excited as I am for these presentations and discussions. So first, we're going to open the floor up to Beth as she walks us through developing your career transition plan. Next slide, please. Thank All you right. so much, Gina. Over to, you, over to you, Beth. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. I'm delighted to be here tonight. And I just started a new job, as you saw, uh, with TRC companies this week. So I have been through the green career transition myself. But tonight I'm going to be speaking to you on my own behalf, uh, reflecting on insights from the more than 300 people who I've worked with 
uh, coaching and teaching over the years to help them step forward into uh, a green career. Next slide, please. Tonight, I'm gonna to do something that might be a little bit different for everyone. I'm gonna share with you a short version and an extended version of a career plan. Um, and so I'll start with the short version you can see here. It's very straightforward. It has the elements of what do you wanna do? How are you going to do it? Relationships are a key part of making any career transition. I think you'll hear from, from most of us tonight. And then why are you doing it? Um, and I just wanna share this brief example because I think it's very important to, to realize that your plan does not have to be complex. Um, as one of my colleagues, Glenn Richardson says, if you don't have a plan for your career, someone else will. So you need to have a strategy that you're going to carry out. Um, and so uh, there also is a reason why there is a triangle here pointing to the why. Um, that is uh, an essential part of getting started with your career plan. Next slide, please. Now, this is my why. Uh, you can see it here. I won't read it for you, but I really want my children, you can see there uh, with my husband and myself uh, and the rest of my family. I guess that's me with the big 90s hair and that picture on the left. Uh, I want all of my children and grandchildren and others in my life, all of you to be able to go outside and enjoy the, the wonder and splendor of nature for generations to come. And so uh, I really wanna encourage you to reflect tonight uh, and type in the chat window if you have a why or maybe it's a homework assignment for you, uh, but it is a, 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 an important part of our career plan. It anchors us to what's important and it calls us forward in the toughest of times. Next slide, please. And our why is based on our emotions. And I would, prob I would guess that Pretty much everyone here is a servant leader. If you're not familiar with the concept, uh, I encourage you to look at the work of Meg Wheatley and Robert Greenleaf. You can see the attributes of what being a servant leader is about. Um, it's really about um, a focus on leading by serving others. And I can't think of any ethos that underpins our industry more than that. Um, and, and there's this also this idea of being in, in it for something that's bigger than ourselves. I love the quote of Harry S. Truman, it's amazing what you can accomplish if you do not care who gets the credit. And that's really what I, I feel our industry is all about. And it inspires me every day. Next slide, please. So in the spirit of inclusion, I know we have some gentlemen here with us tonight at WCS. Um, I wanna share with you some thoughts from um, Leonard Adler. I'm not gonna read all of the, the, the points on this slide, but he has a fantastic newsletter website. He's on social media. Um, some really good points here. First of all, all functional skill sets are needed. It doesn't matter what your training, your experience, your education is, we need you in this field. And uh, I, I, I'm sure that Catherine will speak a little bit to this uh, a little bit later on as well. Uh, but yes, there is a space for everyone, no matter where what your background is. Um, I also want to point out his, his comment here about looking at your work through the lens of justice, equity, and inclusion, no matter where you sit in an organization. That is something that's going to um, really advance our field, and we do need everyone. And finally, his last point here at the bottom, um, to most of all, remember um, what is the future state that you're committed to in 10 years, in 20 years, or beyond that? And I'll come back to that in a moment. Next slide, please. So this is the detailed version of the career plan that I mentioned a few minutes ago. And it, it's, a, it's a very straightforward six component plan. First of all, I spoke to have a plan. Um, the other elements, just briefly, you wanna volunteer, um, do pro bono projects that help expand your network and cultivate new skills. That's been a key to all the transitions I've made and I'm sure probably all of the other panelists will, will speak to that too. You wanna to always be networking and not in it for uh, what that person can do for you, but genuinely connecting and, and understanding what that person contributes and, and develop a relationship with them. Um, you wanna do competitive uh, analysis. Find out what, what skill sets do other people have? If they have a certain certification, is it something you should look at? Um, you wanna know what, what your competitors are are offering uh, in terms of on their resume. Uh, you wanna stay up on market trends and needs. What are the big challenges organizations are dealing with right now? You wanna be 
uh, conversant in them and knowledgeable and, and connect them to the skill sets that you have or ones that you want to acquire. And then finally, you need to develop your brand and all platforms, um, certainly online um, and old school. Um, when I was doing my career transition, I printed a business card that I took to networking events that described what it was I was trying to accomplish. Um, and so you really want to think about how are you telling that story in, in all ways to people who could help you make that, make that next step. Next slide, please. Now this is getting a little bit more into the weeds. I'm not gonna read this slide, but one of the things that I've done all, all throughout my career um, is that I've tried to help focus people on what the current state is versus the desired future state for themselves, and then help them to explore how do you bridge those two realities. And so that's one of the takeaways. I hope that you'll go away, maybe a little homework assignment tonight uh, to think about uh, some of these components and how they might apply to your own career planning efforts. Next slide, please. I hope that I provided you with some good tips and insights for, for planning your career transition. And I'd like to invite you to make a commitment to yourself and that future vision by deciding to take a step uh, in some way. For example, you can see here, becoming a community garden volunteer if you wanna get into food systems, uh, food resilience issues. Um, it just takes that one step and I'll close with a slightly modified quote from um, the famous philosopher Socrates. The secret of career change is to focus all your energy, not on fighting the old, but building the new. Thank you so much. And I'll look forward to questions and um, comments uh, later on in our session. Thank you so much, Beth. What valuable advice. I love the action items that you shared and just be more thoughtful about what you'd like in your career, what you can provide. Um, the value and really making meaningful connections with people. I think sometimes we forget about those, you know, important steps. I really appreciate it. All right. So next, Catherine is going to give us some insight around the mechanics of recruitment. Um, so next slide, please. Perfect. Take it away, Catherine. Hi, I'm Catherine McLean, uh, founder and CEO of Dylan Green. Um, I'll just tell you quickly a little bit about my career journey because I think it might help some people. Um, I had sort of an unconventional career journey in the fact that I, when I graduated college, I then decided to um, go into sales. It was something I knew I was always good at and it seemed like the right idea for me. I went to work for DHL. I did corporate sales for them for a number of years. Um, I had a desire, having lived in New York and DC, to really live abroad, having been surrounded by people from all over the world and not having seen many places, I decided that I, would, I wanted to work abroad. DHL gave me the opportunity to work in London. When I was in London, I subsequently got headhunted to go into recruitment. It was not in my plan at all to be in recruitment whatsoever. Um, however, I was convinced that it could be a good option for me. And it was. I went into recruitment. I really enjoyed it. Um, but I realized uh, when the recession hit that I wanted to do something a bit more meaningful. And so from that, I decided to do a master's in public health instead of going what some might have suggested down the MBA route. Um, after doing the master's degree, I realized a couple things that I am still not good at academics in undergrad nor in my master's. And I'm also, but what I am very good at is networking. And I was very good at networking and getting a lot of people in the class job opportunities. I got myself a job opportunity opportunity um, at the UN in Rome, uh, the Food and Agriculture Organization. And while I was in Rome, I realized a couple of things that um, I was, you know, not the nonprofit world wasn't necessarily something I wanted to do, but I did feel like I was going down the right path of doing something more meaningful. So when I moved back to London, I wound up going back into recruitment within sustainability. Uh, and that's how I got into sustainability. Um, I set up my own firm um, within uh, sustainability, subsequently sold it, merged it, and then left and decided um, when I came back to the US to set up on my own again with a focus on diversity, equity, and inclusion within uh, the clean energy space. I felt it was a very much a dual mission um, of uh, that's something that I was very proud of and very personal to me for a number of reasons. So that's sort of my journey. Didn't get into clean energy till I was 30. Um, didn't get into recruitment until just a couple of years prior to that. So just because you don't know exactly what you want to do right in the beginning of your career doesn't mean that 
um, and having a plan is great, but you should also be open-minded to where life sort of takes you. Um, um, and then there's three things that I would mention as far as the resume is concerned. Uh, the resume, you want to make sure that you focus on your personal statement, and that's past, present, and future. And you want to, uh, sorry, you want to focus on, sorry, my son just woke up, of course. You want to focus on past, present, and future in your personal statement. So that's two sentences about where you've come from, two sentences about what you're currently doing, and two sentences about what you want to do in the future. I can't emphasize this enough, how important this is to have this small personal statement right in the beginning. I think it really sets the tone for the resume, and I don't see it enough. enough. The other thing I'll say is that you want to make sure that your resume is achievement based. I see a lot of resumes where I'm hearing about what people's responsibilities are. While it's important to you, maybe what your responsibilities are, um, when people are interviewing you for positions and looking at you for where you can add value within the organization, they're very much looking at where your achievements have been. So if you left the organization tomorrow, what, what is your legacy? What, what have you done that has really contributed to the bottom line within the firm? Uh, and the final thing I'll say is a very small detail on a resume. I, again, I see a lot is people add to a resume, which I've seen a lot of five, six pagers recently. Um, you really want to keep it to two pages. Um, you, it's fine to put your prior work experience. You can just sort of put the um, company name and what the job title was in the year you were there without going into the specifics. You can have that resume on hand if they want additional information, but you really want to keep it short and concise and to the point. You also want to make sure that when you're adding to it, that you're changing the tense. Again, something I see very often, present tense 20 years ago. You want to have simple things that you, we kind of forget when we're throwing something together. So present for your current job, past for previous jobs. Uh, the next thing I'll talk about is LinkedIn. You want to make sure that your LinkedIn is identical to your resume. This is extremely important. There are so many times that somebody will say to me, well, on his resume, it says this, but on LinkedIn, it says this, which one is it? <laughs> so they really have to mirror and match each other. It's very, very important. The other thing I'll say about LinkedIn is that you want to make sure that you're letting people know what it is that you want to do. So if you're in a current company, let's say you're in oil and gas, you want to transition into renewables, but you don't want your current employer to know that you want to transition to your renewables. You can simply do something creative like, I'm very passionate about the clean energy industry, things like solar, wind, storage. Putting these keywords in will allow recruiters to pick you up in algorithms. And a lot of times when I'm working on opportunities where my clients are saying we're open to candidates from other industries, I don't know who's interested in the industry and who's not unless there's some sort of breadcrumb there within that profile that guides me to let them know um, so let me know that, that they want me to contact them about a clean energy position. Um, and then the final thing I'll say is um, I cannot overemphasize the importance of a thank you note. I had a candidate, um, and I've had this happen several times, and I've had it happen again this week, where candidate was discounted specifically because he did not send a thank you note. Um, I think there's a perception that this is old school. There is nothing old school about it. My clients feel very, very strongly about it. It is something that takes five minutes to do. You wanna wait a few hours until after you've had the call, but it is so, 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 so important that you send a thank you note to after every single person that you speak to uh, in an interview process. Thank you so much, Catherine. That was just a lot of very valuable info. Um, also appreciate sharing your, your sharing your journey into recruitment um, and showing that not everyone's path is linear and that you can get to know where you'd like to go and your notes on achievements and transferable skills. Hope everyone's taking notes, um, but this will be shared afterwards if you can't, you couldn't catch everything. Alrighty, so next, uh, Shantae is going to share her story and tips for transitioning into social entrepreneurship. Take it away, Shantae. Thanks, Gina. I, um, so I actually have transitioned my career a couple of times um, from one industry to the next. I can't went from finance into um, the oil and gas industry. 
And um, what I decided to do, it was very similar probably to what a lot of people are thinking about as they're thinking to transition is I want to do more, right? And so how can I use my skills that I have now to transition or transfer into another space where I can make a better impact or a bigger impact? And so that that's really has been my journey in, career, in, uh, in my career. And then over the last year, it was, I, I still want to do more. There was just this burning um, desire to make a greater impact, specifically around diversity, equity, inclusion, and organizational culture. And so that's when I decided to take the leap into entrepreneurship. So next slide, please. So it's interesting when they when we talked about doing uh, having a conversation about um, social entrepreneurship, I was thinking, you know, I'm an entrepreneur. I don't know if I'm a social entrepreneur because I feel like we all are uh, doing something where we're wanting to give back to the environment, to society, to impact um, um, social justice, um, organizational culture. We're all doing something in some regard, and so for me, it was again, what can I, what more can I do um, to make the impact that I want? And so just thinking about talking to this audience and talking on this panel today, I wanted to make sure there was a few things that, that stood out. And it was interesting after I did my notes, but then I saw some of the things that Beth was going to talk about. I was like, yeah, I actually thought through this in a way that Beth would probably approve that I, I really started with my why, like what was important for me? Um, and, and what was important for my family and had that be my North Star essentially to all the decisions that I was making. And so the first thing I would say is really, you know, get grounded in your why. And also think about what does success look like? You know, a year from now, if you start on this journey, what would that look like for you? Um, and then, and then really start to journal or what have you to get all of those thoughts and feelings out. And so that you can really think about what is it can you do and what's needed in the industry um, or in the environment for the environment or, or for society that you really want to make an impact to. And then I would um, I value mentorship and coaching. And those are two different things for me. Um, I have a mentor that has been a part of my life for about 15 years now. And it started where we did career uh, mentoring. We were partnered up at, a, or, at our organization and really it's about the whole self. And so we just have become really good friends over the years and I have a standing conversation with her and, and she's an executive every month, um, unless we're traveling. It, and it has been that consistent over the years. So leverage your leverage mentorship, formal, informal, um, whatever you think that you might need to ask the questions and get the support that you need. And then also the coaching has benefited me to really, uh, as Beth said, explore the possibilities of what's possible and how you really reach your full potential um, in what you want to do. And then um, I'm a project manager at heart. So everything is be begin with the end in mind. So what does success look like? You know, write it down, make it very plain um, on what success looks like and plan, 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 plan for your transition. So if you're going into a business like I did with entrepreneurship, do all the research um, locally, you know, you know, SBA, what's available through the city, what's available through federal, you know, again, what's available through your networks, um, and then, and also get past just connections, but, uh, but, but building relationships, and plan all of that out. I mean, I literally have a workbook of my uh, plan, and so it went from my business plan and everything, all the administrative things that you have to do to prepare to make the leap, to my social uh, marketing plan, to my financial plan, um, uh, my resources that I need to tap into. So plan all of that out um, so that you have a clear picture and very organizing to you going to your next step. And then make the commitment that you're going to do it. And so I remember being at a leadership training years ago and it was my first time doing zipline and we, you know, go up this very tall tree. And um, 
the I just stood there, I couldn't jump. And I remember the instructor saying, feel the fear and do it anyway. And she tapped me on my shoulder with just a little nudge. And it was the, I mean, I, I it was one of those things where I you didn't think you can do it. And after you made the leap, um, it was so much fun and wanted to do it again. So commit to the leap. And even if it feels scary, um, do it if you feel like you feel really committed to it. And then, and also don't get paralyzed by perfection because everything won't be, be perfect. And then take the leap, just, just do it. And you'll feel confident that you've prepared so you have your plan in place. So you just execute on your plan and the liberation, the freedom to make the impact that you choose to make um, is, is just invaluable. I feel like to what I could bring back to my family for my wellness and my well-being. It does come with risk, obviously. So you want to make sure you thought about all the things that you can mitigate, but you can't, you have to bet on yourself and trust yourself. Amazing. Thank you so much, Shante. I think a lot of us aspire to make a greater impact, but don't always know where to start. And you shared a really great sequence to that approach into social entrepreneurship. And I think a lot of people may be considering that, maybe if they haven't already. Um, so that was wonderful. Thank you. Okay, so last but certainly not least, we have Johanna. She's going to talk a little bit about transitioning into clean tech from oil and gas for experience and insights. So go ahead, Johanna, once you're ready. All right, thank you. You can go to the next slide immediately. So when you find yourself in a transition, uh, it's not too different from when you're looking for your first job, that first opportunity when you may have a perceived gap, uh, but you wanna make sure you have enough of the matching skills and that you can prove that you do. Um, so I usually say you wanna prove that you have at least 70% of the skills they're requiring when you're looking for a job online. Um, but the second thing when you're in a transition that you really have an opportunity to do is to consider what type of company you wanna join. So for example, you may have an experience with a certain company uh, and you learn certain things and now you might, might wanna try something completely different. Um, that could be the size of the company, the culture of the company, uh, the type of efforts, the mission, the values of the company. And so for me, it was really important when I made a transition uh, that I joined a company that really had a serious effort around diversity and inclusion. And so I took a good look at the leadership team uh, that was within the company to make sure they practiced what they preached, so to speak. Uh, so that's something you want to consider because it's not just the job itself that matters, but also the actual um, the, uh, the culture of the company. Um, the next thing is when you're in this kind of transition, you have maybe already decided that you think you have enough matching skills um, that you should apply for the position. Um, but when it comes to your resume itself, you want to make sure that it's truly customized for that exact position and that it also keeps into consideration the company itself and the culture of that company. Uh, so you wanna make sure that you can draw like a red line throughout your entire resume uh, that essentially helps address potential concerns the recruiter or the hiring manager may have about your lack of doing the job because of potentially one experience or two that you may not have because you are making a transition uh, so you want to make sure that you focus on that as you make your updates and truly customize it. Um, the other thing I want to mention is uh, sometimes they will require a cover letter. Um, and as a hiring manager in my current position, as well as in my uh, previous positions, I can say that I have not once actually seen a great cover letter. Uh, I've seen a couple that are okay. And so when you go in through this process of applying for something online, you want to maximize your chances. And so this could be another potential opportunity for you to really share the story about why you wanna make this transition. I usually recommend that you take the actual job description that you're interested in, and then you have your cover letter side to side. Um, and you wanna to try to make sure that you address each one of the qualifications that they're requiring somehow in your cover letter um, so that you can help address the potential concerns that they have about you as a candidate. But it also gives you a little bit of an opportunity to become a little bit more personal than perhaps your resume will do. Um, the next thing is I would encourage you to connect with a recruiter. 
So if you see a job posting someplace, um, often people look at LinkedIn nowadays, so even other job sites, um, is there a way you can find out who that job recruiter is? Is it listed? And if not, maybe you can use some search features uh, and filters to be able to find who that is to make sure you can make a connection, make sure you let them know you're either going to apply for this job or you are in the process of applying for this job and that you're really interested and that you think your skills are a good match. Uh, you want to make a positive impact, right? Because you want to maximize every potential touch point that you have with this organization uh, so that your chances are as high as possible. From my perspective, when I saw the job posting of the job I currently hold today, um, I went to the website to explore what the requirements were as part of the application process. And so I saw what I believed to be qualifying criteria. Um, and for example, it had a question, this was a yes or no question, and it asked if you had X number of years of senior leadership experience. And so for me, I was sitting there and I was considering and I came to the conclusion that the number of years of leadership experience I had in a senior position was a couple of years less than they asked for. And so I would have answered no to that question. Uh, as a result, I thought maybe this is not worth my time. Maybe I shouldn't apply for this position. But because I was already connected with the recruiter, I reached out to the recruiter um, and clar asked him to clarify uh, he got back with me quickly and let me know that absolutely, I should still apply. Uh, that was just one of the criteria. And so that's why it's good to make sure you have that connection so you can leverage and learn from it. Now, the next thing is with respect to your network. You want to use stuff for many things, but I'll highlight a couple of things. Um, you want to see if you can learn about the company. Is this the company? Um, all the research you've done online, can somebody verify it? You know, do you know somebody that works there or know somebody who knows somebody who works there so you can get some inside information? Um, but you could also leverage it to have somebody put in a good word for you for that job, for example. And so in my case, I leverage my network in two ways. Uh, first, I reached out to actually one of my former managers because he had previously worked in the clean tech space uh, years ago. And so I thought he might be, one, familiar with the company and being able to tell me a little bit about it. Um, but two, he may know somebody there. He didn't know anybody at the company, but he knew about the company quite a bit, um, and he had followed them for many years. Uh, and so he kind of helped validate some of the things that I had learned in my own research about the company that helped validate that I was still really interested in this particular company. And he also told me great things about the leadership, things that were important to me as I was making a uh, transition. Um, the second example is I reached out to somebody who, uh, a friend of mine, who um, is a CEO for her own company. Um, and it seemed to me like there might be a potential match between what she's doing and this company that I was interested in. And so I thought she might either be familiar with them already, and if not, it would be useful for her to be familiar with them. Uh, so I reached out to her um, and she learned about the company. She was very interested. She made a connection um, with the company. Um, and then further down the road, she actually ended up sending them a note recommending me for the job I had applied for. And so you wanna make sure that you explore all different options so you can maximize your chances. Uh, you can go to the next slide, please. All right, so let's assume you have applied to a job. Now you're in the waiting mode. Uh, for me, I was waiting two weeks, hadn't heard anything back. Um, I decided to connect with the recruiter again, touch base, make sure to let him know I was still very interested in this position. Uh, he reached out back with me very quickly uh, let me know that they already have some candidates that they were moving towards the interview phase with, um, that they seemed to be slightly better matches than myself. Um, of course, that's not the message I wanted to hear. I was a little disappointed, but I made sure to reply politely and say, thank you very much. I appreciate uh, the feedback and for getting back with me. I'm still very interested. So if anything changes, you know, I have some flexibility in my schedule. So please, please get back with me. Um, about two days later, I heard back from him again saying we decided to give you a chance, we wanna move forward. Um, the next stage of the screening process is a questionnaire. And so in this particular case, I received a questionnaire and you can imagine, this is not a yes or no multiple choice uh, type questionnaire, um, but it was um, essay type questions. Uh, I had a pretty limited amount of time to, to answer it. Um, but the key here is that this is what's in between you and a potential interview. So you wanna make sure uh, you go through a similar mindset as when you're customizing your resume. You want to make sure that when you answer those questions, 
you address any concerns that the recruiter or the hiring manager may have about you and any of those potential gaps or experiences that you don't have because you're making a transition. So you wanna make sure that as you're answering these questions, you continuously show examples of where those concerns may be addressed. In my case, um, that questionnaire ended up being 16 pages. I took quite a bit of work uh, to go through. Uh, but at the end of that, I was pretty well aware of what the company also were looking for based on the questions that they had, they had asked. And of course, it helped prepare me for my interview. And, but when it comes to the preparation of the interview, you all have probably downloaded all kinds of questions from the internet and typed up your answers and have essentially answers prepared for an interview should one come up. But now is the time to actually go through and customize how you would answer those questions based on the exact position in the company. So you wanna continue with that red thread that you've done through your resume and through a potential questionnaire in those answers as well. And then of course, you wanna leverage those interviews, ask questions, because even if you're a candidate and you have expressed an interest in a company, you may learn throughout the process of interviewing that this company or this position is not exactly what you had in mind. So you wanna make sure to take advantage and confirm your own interest in both the company and in the position. And then finally, references. And I think a lot of people kind of ignore this one. They just, oh, I have a boss here. I'm gonna make sure he's my reference. And I'll share a story with you with respect to why I think maybe that step is a little bit more important. Um, in my past, I was nominated for a couple of awards. And at the time, of one award, I have one manager, and at the time of another award, I had another manager. Uh, and these companies that were given out the awards as part of the screening process, they were requesting letters of recommendation. And so for the first manager, uh, the letter was supposed to go directly from the person providing the recommendation to the company, so I never got to see it. Um, but the next time, uh, it was something I got to see, and I used you know, his successor, the next manager. Um, it was the same executive assistant and so when she handed me uh, the letter that was prepared for the second manager, uh, she told me, she said, this is a really nice letter. It says you're great and gives some nice examples. But she said, it is nothing compared to the letter that was submitted on your behalf last year. And that made me think uh, about references and how you use them. Because it's about finding that person who can paint a picture, tell a story about you, and sell you. because. If that's the final step, sometimes there are more than one candidate left at this step. You wanna make sure that you become that person that gets selected. So make sure that you pick the right reference. And with that, I'll hand it back over to Gina. Thank you so much, Johanna. Definitely making meaningful connections is so important. It really does make a difference. And it was very valuable to hear how you determined um, what role was right for you in your process, I think. That's very helpful for people that are in the same spot. So appreciate that. All right, so we're going to move into our audience, um, our moderated Q&A. So thank you to everyone that shared a question in the chat. If you wanna share a question that you uh, have had throughout these wonderful speaker presentations, feel free to drop it in the chat. Um, we're going to try to answer as many as we can that benefit the audience. And then feel free to connect with the speakers following the event. Um, if we go to the next slide, you should be able to see each of um, the speakers we've had today and it will go to the um, previous slides to get their contact info towards the end so you can follow up with them. All right, so we're going to start with our first question directed towards Johanna. Um, what do you mean by customizing your resume? Do I lift word for word what the job description says? And also uh, this person is asking if they should call or mail the recruiter. Yeah, so with customizing your resume, and we have other experts on the panel too, so feel free to jump in, Catherine, for example. Um, no, you want to make sure that it matches the job description. Yeah. And so every job is going to have certain criteria, certain qualifications, certain experiences. They may have some things that they wish somebody has, but not mandatory. But you want to go through each one of those line by line and make sure, back to Catherine's point, when you're talking about your accomplishments, that your accomplishments help hit those points. Definitely, yeah. Catherine, and then do Catherine, you wanna jump in? If not, I'll- Yeah, I, I think the other question that you asked was to get in touch with the recruiter. How, how do you go about getting in touch with the recruiter? Was that what you asked? 
Right. If they yeah. should mail or call the recruiter. Yeah. I feel very strongly about this. <laughs> um, please do not call me. Like with all due respect, um, I am more than happy to have a conversation with anybody I'm working with, a client candidate. Otherwise, I, I just find when somebody calls me, um, it just, uh, it, I'm not ready for it because there's like a lot go, going on. So I would really appreciate if they would email me first. Um, and I've actually been on the back end of this as well, where I've called people and they've been like really snippy with me. <laughs> So I think it's just probably like a good rule of thumb, even a text, like a text is cool. Like, can we talk like an email is cool, LinkedIn, but yeah, I think actually like picking up the phone, the only time that like, I'm okay with someone picking up the phone. Last night I had a client call me at seven o'clock at night and I was like really like irritated. And then he was like, want to offer your cannon. And then I was like, oh, it's like absolutely fine that you were calling me seven o'clock at night. I will prioritize call <laughs> that's a good point it's it's important to consider the recruiter preference um yeah. and help make that a good relationship yeah appreciate those points so i think one of our next questions is one that probably a lot of people have thought about um which is everyone's advice um, on important newsletters events just ways to find resources so i think we can kick off with beth um in terms of maybe finding your area your niche and then we can move over to Shante if you have any entrepreneurial resources that you'd like to recommend right off the bat. Sure, Gina, I'm glad to, to speak to that. Um, I, I was just looking at this this week, in fact, uh, a couple of the top ones that I really like is um, uh, Morning Consult has an energy uh, newsletter that comes out every day. I, I really love that. I, it's just a good synopsis of everything. Another one is um, Energy and Environment. Um, then there's also some regional newsletters. Um, I get the Northeast Energy News. Uh, so that gives a good compilation of a, a lot of things across the industry. And similarly to what you just said, absolutely. Whatever, wherever your interest lies, if it's in solar, then subscribe to a bunch of different solar newsletters. Um, if it's circular economy, et cetera, there are a lot of great free resources available um, based on the industry, the part of the industry that you wanna pursue. So uh, the other part of that is um, go to events too. You'll learn a lot by just sitting and listening to webinars um, and hearing people speak. You'll pick up jargon, lingo, you'll understand how things work, who the players are in the field. So um, I would add that as well. Great points. And I think, you know, we're thinking about, um, and I'm by no means an expert in entrepreneurship, but some of the resources that I use, is what, like I mentioned, is the SBA. Um, there's resources at the city level. I'm here in Houston, and the city of Houston has a lot of resources for entrepreneurs, and specifically women-owned business and minority-owned businesses. Um, there's a lot of resources for them. And then, like Beth mentioned, it's really about the topic. So my expertise is, is around um, enterprise change leadership and diversity, equity, inclusion, and standing up and leading those programs. So I follow organizations um, and follow articles that's based on that. And, and obviously HBR, it gives out a lot of great content, but I spend most of my time from a business sense on LinkedIn, looking at um, some of the major followers and the articles that they are putting out. And LinkedIn gives you obviously a summary too of some of the things that you're following and so that you can stay abreast of what's changing. Um, so that that would be, I mean, uh, if you're committed to a specific topic or area, then you would find those organizations that support it. And then the other piece I would say is nonprofits that may be in the areas they um, that you can get involved with and volunteer with so you get a chance to build relationships um, with the folks that work in the nonprofits within that specific area. And, um, and that, that's also a great resource and network to, um, to engage with. Those are great resources. And we will, um, if any of our audience members have resources they'd like to share as well, feel free to drop them in the chat. We'll be sending out a post attendee resource guide that will have all of these as you all move forward in your clean tech journeys, whether you're transitioning just a student, you know, interested in learning more wherever you are in your journey. Um, so let's move to another question that kind of leads right into finding virtual events. 
Um, would love to hear the panel's opinion about networking in the time of remote and virtual events. How do you stand out and how do you connect virtually in, in, in a meaningful way? Um, so I'll let Catherine speak to that first if you like. Um, I think a lot of people here have already done it. You know, I have all these messages that have come um, from people in this event on LinkedIn, uh, really thoughtful messages about like a point that I made here, or a point that was made there that they, um, you know, could I do I have time to have a chat with them, etc. I think that's how you do it. I think that they're, you're doing it right now. Um, I think that, um, I mean, I, I, I personally prefer in-person events, but I also feel like so much of personal events is, you know, and this is just how I feel like seeing someone, engaging with someone. And I find a lot of the events you have to wear, you know, you have to be protective of, you have to protect yourself and we're in a pandemic and you're not maybe able to communicate um, in the same way that we that we were. And so I think you can find those meaningful connections being you know, in, in a virtual environment. It's just by being a little bit more proactive and a little bit more um, perhaps um, intentional about who it is that you're contacting uh, off the back of, a, of the event and looking maybe ahead of time at who's gonna be at the event um, and scheduling uh, some, some, a lot of these events have opportunity like networking breaks and stuff. So maybe doing some homework before you go on the event to have some time with people during the breaks. Um, yeah, great points. Does anyone else want to uh, give any tips they've had or would like to share about making meaningful connections um, with virtual events in the setting that most of us are in right now? I think Catherine covered it. I, I agree with all the great points that she made. Yeah, I think it's great. Continue definitely for everyone to network and connect. I think, um, as she mentioned, just, you know, making your your note, make sure you have a LinkedIn note and make sure that you're kind of pointing towards something that you found meaningful um, and try to keep it two-sided as well. So let's move I, on. Yeah. I think that's a really good point, that last point to keep it two-sided. And I think Beth touched on it quickly in her presentation is that you don't always have to just contact someone to say, hey, it'd be good to talk to you about my career. Like at their time, like there are so many times that people will say to me, like, what Hey, you know, how can I help you? And like, I'm always a bit taken aback. I'm like, Ooh, I don't know. How can you help me? Oh my goodness. So <laughs> I think it's, um, it's always worth keeping that in mind that just because it's a recruiter or a candidate or, a, you know, hiring manager that you remember that we're all people and like, we're, it's all, we should all be thinking about other people first, because I just really believe in that kind of good karma and good juju. Mm -hmm. Couldn't agree more. It makes it a lot more enjoyable too. Yeah. And, and one more thing I will add as well, when people think about networking, they tend to think about strictly new connections. And that's great. You want to definitely get new connections, but you want to make sure to maintain the ones you have, right? There's a lot of people you may have known for a long time. Maybe you haven't touched base with them in a while. You can do that easily virtually. Send them a message on LinkedIn if you don't have their contact phone number or email. Uh, and you can set up a Teams meeting. You can do a happy hour over Teams meeting, if you will. Because um, that's another thing that I think people tend to forget about. They just think about expanding it, but not necessarily maintaining the network they have. So just wanted to point that out. Yeah, Good just to, just to add to that real quick is when I, that was exactly, you know, what I meant when I said connecting versus building relationships too. Because if you, if you're, if you're, if you're circling back with people that are in your network, like John mentioned that you haven't talked to for a while, maybe every few months, you just check in with them, have a quick coffee chat. I mean, with Zoom, all of these things are so easy now. You'll be amazed um, how that relationship feels. And that means, it, and then it's a mutual, it's also a mutual relationship where if they have something that comes up, then they, they could think of you top of mind because you're staying connected with them and vice versa. And that's how we help each other. I love that point. I think it, it is important to consider both people that you've you know, known, known for a long time, as well as new connections, because it's great to have those chats too and reconnect with people. All right. So I think there were a couple of questions I saw about mentorship um, and how you recommend approaching people who you'd like to become your mentor. Uh, so I don't know if anyone wants to kick off with that question. I'm happy to say a few words about that. I had someone contact me just in the last couple of weeks and asked, me that question. Um, 
And so I think it's about finding that commonality, that connection. Uh, this person, it was a very short no, but the person talked about uh, their career just very briefly and then talked about what I've done and, and asked if I might be interested in, in mentoring them. Um, I do know that there are several organizations, uh, for example, another group uh, that I've been involved in, um, the Council on Women in Energy and Environmental Leadership, CWheel, has a formal mentoring program. Um, so you can also access some of those channels. So look into some of the different groups that you're a part of. Um, I think WCS has an initiative for mentoring too, right? So yeah, there are a lot of avenues to go direct as well as through the structured um, programs. Yeah, I would uh, add to, um, so WSC, but also Lean in Energy has a mentor program as well, but they may, uh, I think they open it up every, the cycle every year, but they also have um, what they call flash mentoring. So if you're a member, you can sign up to, to be, um, to have a mentor session. Um, I mean, I'm pretty, I'm pretty passionate about this too, because you have to have, you have to share the same values um, of a mentor. I think, um, frankly, everybody can't be a mentor. Um, you have to know that person has to be willing to give themselves and you have to be prepared as a mentee to make the commitment as well that what it takes to build that relationship um, over time. And then also there's, um, you know, mentorships can help you obviously with your career. But again, I believe it's the whole person because your career impacts your family and your whole life. Um, and so, so it just depends on what you wanting to get out of the mentorship relationship um, as well. But I also think coaching, which is very different than mentorship, is a great avenue um, as well, especially when people are thinking about advancing or evolving their career, um, because you really have those answers within you. And a coach helps you reach and explore that, that those opportunities um, as well. Those are great points. Yeah, I, I think, think we had one thing. person uh, real quick that asked um, Beth to repeat the name of the council and then Johanna, I'd love to hear your thoughts as well. Sure, it's CWIL, the Council on Women in Energy and Environmental Leadership. It's a part of the Association of Energy Engineers, C-W-E-E-L. All right, one thing I wanted to add about mentorship as well is um, sometimes your organization will have formal programs. And if you're not necessarily selected uh, to participate, if it's a selection process or they have a certain number only, they're allowed to participate. Uh, don't take that as a bad thing, but consider finding a mentor yourself, just to Beth's point, she said somebody just reached out to her. Uh, Cause I find that sometimes people believe that a formal mentoring program is the key to anything. Um, and it certainly can be great. And I'm not saying you shouldn't pursue those, but I say think a little bit outside the box when it comes to mentorship and consider who are some people in either your organization or in your network, uh, maybe in your past organizations, maybe you're in your universities, et cetera, that you have found that you've had that type of connection with and you admire the type of decisions they've been making and you think they could have some good influence on your career. Because that's a relationship you may already have, hopefully, uh, to some extent, or you can maintain it, uh, and you can reach out to them. Um, and it doesn't necessarily have to be a super formal thing when it's, it has to be, you know, once a month or something like that, but you can be flexible. Uh, and keep in mind that you should seek out different mentors for different things. Uh, same thing as coaching, right? Not everybody is an expert at giving advice at everything. So you want to make sure that you are seeking it from people that you admire in those areas. Um, so that could become a very customized things for you that doesn't have to be very formal. And you can find yourself in a situation quite quickly when you have many mentors and many coaches that will really help transform you. Great point. It's good to have someone, you know, an expert in each corner and not just rely on one person. Yeah. And I'll just say one, one, one thing yeah, about definitely. mentors. One thing about mentorship is because I get asked this question a lot about, um, you know, women and networking, um, sorry, mentoring other women and so forth. But a lot of the mentors that I've had in my life that have been the closest to me that have offered me the most valuable advice have actually been males. And I think it's important to remember that it's awesome to have female mentors, but it's also like, like the um, previous ladies were saying, like you wanna have a diverse set of people 
giving you advice and guidance. And by having a diverse set of people, that includes um, men as well. And um, I've learned a lot in my career from, from men just as much as I have from women. That's a great point and a good one to uh, end on. I think we've had a lot of wonderful questions. Thank you all to thank you all who asked questions. I think we had you know more than we could get to, but definitely recommend if you would like to uh, follow up with our speakers. Um, I think if you all want to drop for our speakers, if you could drop your LinkedIn's in the chat as well, just so we don't have to go back and forth between sides, that that would be great. Um, so we're going to wrap up now. Let's see. Uh, could we please go to the next slide? Perfect. So I want to give a big thank you to today's WCS volunteers. Couldn't have these events without the volunteers behind it. So I want to thank uh, Tina Calvin, who is the co-organizer for this event. Big thank you to her. Uh, we have our marketing event lead, Sapna, who did a great job, um, you know, getting the word out and helping everyone to, to find out about this event and helping you all to get here. And then we have our Zoom producers for today. So we have Tina, Alyssa, and Kirpa. So big thank you to everyone. If you'd like to be a volunteer, definitely make sure to contact Kirpa. There are a lot of great things that come out of being a WCS volunteer, um, so it's a great opportunity. All right, next slide, please. And join us in the virtual world. So we are still virtual for events, but if you'd like to follow any of the socials, uh, keep, keep yourself posted on upcoming events and other WCS opportunities, definitely that is a great way to you know keep in touch with us all. Um, and if you haven't shared your LinkedIn, you can pop it in right now. We'll get it in. Um, save the chat if you'd like to, since we won't be circulating it. And we really appreciate you all for coming. Thank you again. Hope you have a great rest of your evening or afternoon and hope these help these tips were helpful. Thank you.